Greetings fellow Mist Wanderers, my name is Steve Morgan and this is DM of the Mists covering all things Curse of Strahd and Ravenloft. In this video we're going to be talking about a Ravenloft NPC listed in the Mist Wanderers section of Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft called Ferran Zalhonen, a supposed powerful Archmage. Now if you know Curse of Strahd, some of the other Mist Wanderers will be familiar to you, the likes of Esmeralda Davenir and Dr. Rudolf Van Richten. Oh I say Richten but I know it's Richten, old habit, forgive me. If I say Richten I mean Richten. And then if you're familiar with some other of Ravenloft, you might know the Weathermay Foxgrove twins, Alnick Ray, Jan de Sunstar, and so on. Ferran seems like a unusual one, who seems quite light on lore. If you know who he actually is, he's a pretty big deal. And he's not someone that if you're reading through all the Miss Wanderers and thinking who should you include in your Ravenloft campaign or one shots, he's not someone I would advise glossing over or just ignoring. And so today we'll be talking about Ferran, who when I showed my players the artwork immediately said he looks like a goth version of Matt Mercer and hey, they're not wrong. Let's talk firstly about the pronunciation. So I thought it was Ferran because it looks like a spout Ferran. Now interestingly there is a Ravenloft Mist Hunters module, that's the Adventurous League, called A Dark Lord's Denouement. I think it's the final chapter or final section of the entire series. And it kind of covers Ferran and Ferran's past and who he actually is and who he's revealed to be. And they've got little pronunciation guides in there and they seem to think it's Firon, which I don't know. It may, I, I, look at, I look at the word Ferran and it looks like Ferran, not Firon. And by this point, by the time I discovered this, I'd already said Ferran to my players. So I'm going to stick with Ferran. Technically, it's not right, but you'll have to forgive me. And in my campaign, at least, Ferran is very important. He is a important part of the setup for the BBEG. And I'm going to say now there's big spoilers here for his connection to Aslin Rex, who's a popular old villain of Ravenloft, alongside the likes of Strahd, Von Zorovich, etc. I'm only saying this because, well, first, firstly, if you're a player, you shouldn't be watching this anyway. Get out of here. But even if you're not a player, I remember looking in the Ravenloft subreddit when I was researching about Ferran and Azalyn. And even within the Ravenloft subreddit, people were marking spoiler tags for stuff about this. So maybe I'm being a little bit, bit overly cautious here, but just, just to stress, big spoilers here for who Ferran is and his ties to Ravenloft as a whole, which I'll get to in a few minutes. So you've got to, this is your warning now, to click off this video if you, that's not something you want spoiled for yourself. Also, I'll give my usual disclaimer that this video assumes you have some knowledge of Ravenloft, you know who the Vistani are, you know who Madame Eva is, things like that. I won't necessarily explain, stop and explain every single thing, so I might start talking about things like that, and it presumes that you know a little bit of Ravenloft and who these characters or groups of people are based on their information in Curse of Strahd and Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. Let's look at the lore for Ferran. So as mentioned, he has some information in Van Richten's Guide in the Mist Wanderers section. It's very light. And it's quite vague as well. I think this is kind of done on purpose. So if people don't know who Ferran actually is, they can kind of meld him into whatever they want rather than feeling like they have to do it in this certain way because he's this certain character. But obviously, if you do know who Ferran is and how he fits into the whole picture, it's kind of a cool thing to read and it's not necessarily spelt out to you. It just essentially hints at who he is and what he is. So the, the, it's respectful of the old lore as well. There is, of course, Mysterpedia, and if you Google Ferran Zalhonen, I think you're going to get an article for somebody else, which will become obvious when I get to that in a minute. To be honest, the best place for information about Ferran is an old Ravenloft novel called King of the Dead. Now, the tricky thing is, is about half of the Ravenloft novels are still available to read or listen to today. I've read or listened to most of them, either through getting them on Kindle or getting them as audiobooks. King of the Dead is not one of them. But you can still get hold of a paperback on eBay, you might get lucky, but I understand they're quite pricey, quite difficult to get hold of, especially the ones that aren't available on Kindle or an audiobook. I was very lucky that I did manage to get a copy of King of the Dead and read it before introducing Ferran in my campaign. And this is where we get into spoiler territory. So essentially, Ferran is this powerful traveling wizard who appears at the border of Darkon with very little memory of who he was, how he got there, and things like that. He learns that there's a lich in the castle, Avernus, in Darkon, and goes to confront him. This lich is called Darkless Rex. When the two fight, the good wizard, Ferran, and the evil lich, Darkless, Ferran defeats Darkless, only to realise that the two 
are actually connected. The two of them together, and this is only revealed when Fran gets his memories back after defeating Darkalus, and when Darkalus is defeated, is that the two of them combined make Aslin Rex, the Lich, the true ruler of Darkon and the ruler of it before Darkalus. Which is a really, it's a really cool story, it's a really good read and it's really good to get an insight into who Faran is. So if you do manage to get a hold of a copy, it's, you know, great. I wouldn't say it's required reading. If you, you can obviously pick up stuff through what I'm saying in this video, what's out there on like Mr. Pedia and things like that. But if you can read it, it's great. And there is, of course, information in that Mist Hunters module I mentioned earlier. I'll put a link uh, for that in the description. Let's move on to role-playing Faran. So Bam Richardson's guide describes him as being, and I quote, arrogant and abrasive. Now, if he's playing a more minor role in your campaign, feel free to do that. But because he's a pretty important part of my campaign and who he's revealed to be, I want my players to get on with him, I want them to like him, and I want them to be sad when he dies later on and essentially becomes Azalin. So I played him as nicer than what he's kind of described as in Van Rich's Guide. And I did a whole Reddit post about this saying that, you know, I felt a bit guilty because it doesn't feel true to the law, but I think it's for it, it was important for my game that he's portrayed like that. And I think a few people commented saying, well, you know, that's fair enough. And I was probably being too hard on myself. It was funny, actually, because um, the whole thing about my player saying he looked like a goth Matt Mercer, I probably did lean on what Matt Mercer's like when he plays sort of nobleman in, if you've watched things like, I can't speak for Critical Role because I've not properly watched Critical Role, but Vox Machina, the Amazon series, which is based on the adventures of Critical Role, when he plays sort of noble, because obviously he does some of the NPCs, and he does the, the name escapes me, Silas Briarwood, I think it is, the, the main villain of the first series, who's a, a vampire. I kind of played him in that way, kind of that respectful, ah, hello, friends of Madame Eva, my name is Faran. It'd be lovely to work with you to try and find some amber vestiges. I think my players at first were a little bit caught off guard and thought, this guy's a little bit suspicious. But just generally, very friendly, very polite, very respectful, that kind of thing. He has a hazy memory, so kind of like from King of the Dead. He knows some stuff. He said, he'll explain to the players that, or the, the, the characters, that he arrived in the Domains of Dread at some point. And he knows that he's from another world. He knows that he had a teenage son who died. But he doesn't really know much about his previous life beyond that. He remembers when he first kind of appeared in the Domains of Dread that he was in Darkon, first of all, and the Vistani rescued him. Rescued in the sense that he had no idea where he was. He didn't really need rescue because he's a powerful wizard, and a bunch of zombies might have appeared and he would have obliterated them. But rescued in the sense that they could guide him about, or they could explain where he was, what he was doing there, explain to him the nature of the Domains of Dread, the nature of the mists, and so on. I gave him a bunch of other traits as well, which aren't listed in the book. Later on, I'll talk about his stat block and go into more detail there. But the other traits I gave him were that he can't learn or change his spells. And this is a nod to Azalin. And he doesn't like his current spells either, because as I'll talk about later, the spell list he's got is pretty brutal. It's some of them are very deadly, dangerous spells. He actually has access to a ring of spell storing, which he uses mostly for mage armor, because mage armor isn't in his spell repertoire. He hates Darkon. Wretched place. Awful. He'll avoid it at all costs. He hates liches. He has nightmares about liches and he believes that his teenage son who died was killed by a lich. He hates everything he's heard about Strahd and thinks that if him and Strahd had a battle then he would have won. I am um, In my game he was introduced after my players defeated Strahd as per the events of Curse of Strahd and one of the first things he said is, ah oh, you're the guys who defeated Strahd, oh, I wish I'd been there with you and taken him out myself. And this is obviously a nod to the second I Strahd novel, The War Against Azalin, where Strahd and Azalin are, I was going to say frenemies, but I think, <laughs> I don't think frenemies is the right word either because I don't think there's any friend equation. Very extremely uneasy alliance is probably the better way to put it for first half of the book and then bloodthirsty arrivals for the second half. He also can't leave the domains as a whole. So the thing I did with Faran is that Dark Lords can't leave their own domains and he's essentially part of a Dark Lord. He can travel between domains but he can't leave the Domains of Dread as a whole. So he couldn't go to the, the Sword Coast or any other worlds outside of the Domains of Dread but he can travel between them. And when he does travel he prefers to do so in the company of the Vistani. I think this is said in Van Richardson's guide where He's very nervous about travelling the mists with anyone else or on his own. He seeks amber vestiges and as a whole, just general information about the domains, how the mists work and so forth, so on and so forth. He has a pet imp called Skiva, who 
primarily takes the form of a piebald raven. Piebald ravens, I think, are the ones that are like black with patches of white rather than just being a pure black raven. And imps can transform into ravens as well as, I'm looking at my notes here on my other screen, uh, rats and spiders. Okay, moving on to the stat block. So Van Richten's Guide recommends Archmage. And I think you should use Archmage because it's a good stat block. But with some changes. He has the same spells as a Lich. Now I think because of their spell casting difference, I think I had to remove one or two. And I think one or two Lich spells don't make sense. For example, Liches have the spell Plane Shift. Now that's near enough useless in uh, the Domains of Dread, is my understanding. So I think I removed that one or, uh, one or two others and made sure it was the same amount of spells that an Archmage would have. But that means he doesn't have things like Mage Armor. He can't change his spells, as mentioned earlier. And he has magic items to sort of fill gaps or that are true to his lore. For example, the Ring of Spells storing just contains Mage Armor. When he was working with my players, he asked the Wizard PC if he could cast Mage Armor into the Ring a few times to keep it stocked up. And he also has a Staff of Frost, because I believe in the old lore, Azalin had one. In his art in Vanishing's Guide, it actually looks like he's wearing a Road to the Arch Mage Eye. Uh, I'm actually saving that for Azalin's stat block, so I'm gonna, he's gonna be the Lich stat block for the Monster Manual, but I'm also gonna give him some magic items, including the Robe of the Archmage Eye. I didn't know where else to put this in the video, so it's, this feels a bit miscellaneous, but I'm gonna include it here. There are some people who add him to Curse of Strahd, and there's a good place to add him, is if he re replaces who the ma Mad Mage is. So the Mad Mage, spoiler alert for Curse of Strahd, spoiler alert for who the Mad Mage is right now, is Morden Kanan, the classic, famous wizard from D&D lore. And a lot of people think that's really weird and it's kind of, some people think it's just kind of like a, a nod or a homage to the old lore. And there are various, I'm probably going to do a separate video about this, where there are people who think, oh, instead of it being Mordy, it could be a bunch of other people. And some people say it could be Franz Alhonen, and that's quite cool. And then he regains his memories of maybe who he was before he you know, became mad, but maybe then that he doesn't get all of them back. So he's, he's sort of like Faran rather than Azalin, and that he then needs to figure out who he is and who he was and things like that. So that's quite a cool idea. Let's talk about how things have played out in my campaign so far. So when I ran Curse of Strahd, my players were completionists and they wanted to do absolutely everything, even beyond the places they had to go to because of the card reading or what have you. But two of my players had to move away to a place in remote Canada with not very good internet because we all play online, we're all, uh, until they moved to Canada, we're all based around different parts of the UK. So I was like, oh great! So they were in Argenvostholt at the time, and they hadn't done Berez or the Amber Temple. So when they defeated Strahd, a bunch of players left, a few of my players remained, wanted to carry on with a sequel campaign with the same characters, and moved on to the wider Ravenloft campaign we're doing now. They briefly went to Markovia, they spent a good while in Falkovnia, and then they decided to go back to Barovia. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I feel like I'm digressing, but I understand there are different people treat returning to domains differently. Some people say you can't. Some people say, oh, without a Dark Lord, the domain would crumble. I'm going with the law that was in Curse of Strahd, and I understand in Van Richter's Guide, it kind of leaves it open to the, if you're creating, say, your own Dark Lord, it, there's a whole section about what happens when the domain doesn't have a Dark Lord. It doesn't necessarily have to, you know, fall apart. But in the case of Curse of Strahd, it says that Strahd will return a few months later. So there is a few months of peace and uh, that sort of feeling that everything is fine in the world, but it's not. So anyway, I've, I've completely forgotten the point I was making. Yes, oh, so yeah, so they can return to Barovia. It's not a case of when they left, they can never return there again. So they return to Barovia, they see the old familiar faces, everything's fine and dandy in Barovia, it's peaceful. People from outside of Barovia are now traveling into Barovia because it's safe. They're able to import and export and all that jazz, and they feel like a regular country that can do all these things, that isn't just trapped in, in its own version of hell and its own demiplane. Anyway, my players thought, right, we know there's still Berez, there's still Babala Saga, and there's still this Amber Temple. They also got hold of Lupus Torque of Souls while they were in Falkovnia, which is a very powerful magic item. They knew it was tied to an old Vistani seer. So they wanted to talk to their Vistana seer friend, Madame Eva, about these cards. When they went to Serpul Encampment, this is another thing I should say as well. In the epilogue of Curse of Strahd, it suggests that all the Vistani leave Vorovia. I had it just be the Vistani based just outside Velaki. That's Aragol, Luvash, Arabal's camp. I kept Madame Eva's camp there. They go to Sir Paul Encampment. They see Madame Eva, and she introduces them to her friend, Ferran Zalhonen. 
and he explains that he's looking for amber vestiges and the amber temple up in the mountains apparently has quite a few but he's been warned he's he's, he's quite a confident capable wizard he says this in a way that isn't arrogant that is quite you know he, he thinks he can just wander into this daddy temple on his own and be like yeah it'll be fine madam even warns him that that might not be the best idea it'd probably be best if he, he went with very strong capable people and she suggests going with the adventurers and they were like, oh, we were going to go there anyway. Why don't we all just all team up and go together, which is great. My players also made a base out of Fidatov Manor. I mentioned this in a couple of other videos. This is a old ruined manor house outside Kresk. They did it up and they invited Faran to stay the night before they go into the Amber Temple, which is a really important detail for later on. They go to the Amber Temple and straight away that Akarnaloth in the statue nearly kills them all with its fireballs and chain lightning. So straight away Faran is like, yeah, it's a good idea I listen to Madame Eva because I think I, you know, most things I can handle that this was a bit over the top. And they navigate the temple. They visit many of the amber vestiges. It was quite funny how they, there were quite a few wizards of the party. So there's a wizard PC, Faran's our home, and they had Viktor Valakovich as a, um, an NPC ally. And then they see Vilnius as well. Oh, and they took Casimir as well, but Casimir I changed because I didn't want like another mage stat block. I had Casimir be a, because of his artwork, kind of shows him as almost like a rogue. I think I went with a Master Thief stat block for him. But anyway, digressing again, sorry. Uh, a cool couple of things happened in the Amber Temple that were kind of hints and nods to Faran and his nature and who he actually was. So they go to, there's a room. One of the Amber's Vestige rooms has some Nothics in it, and I love Nothics. Before doing Curse of Strahd, we did Lost Man of Fandalver, and spoiler alert for that, there's a Nothic in that, and my players loved him. They thought he was really weird and quirky. And Nothics can read minds. And it was really funny that everyone except for Faran passed the saving throw. And Faran, I think, even has advantage because of the Archmage stat block. And they were able to read his mind. And I had them that they were basically screaming in terror and hiding from Faran, even though he just stood, stood there harmlessly. And he's freaked out by their reaction to him because he's worried, why are they reacting to me like that? I'm not even doing anything. And one of my players can speak the language Nothics can speak, which I've forgotten off the top of my head, so I'm going to look it up. Undercommon. And the Nothics were just basically pointing at him saying, Lich, Lich, Lich. And Faran says, maybe they found some old memories of mine, or maybe they can re see my nightmares about how I have nightmares about liches. I think at this point he hadn't told the players about this. So he was saying, listen, I have nightmares about liches. And I think a lich killed my teenage son. And maybe that's what they're clinging on to. And my players are like, okay, that's a bit suspicious, but fine. Later they meet Exathanta, who is the Lich. If you know Kursa Strahd and know the Amber Temple, there's a Lich in the Amber Temple, but he's been there for such a long time without filling his phylactery that he's essentially falling apart. And he's got memory issues. He doesn't have access to his spells unless he's sort of restored through something like the casting Greater Restoration. And my players were just kind of wandering around, looking around, and they see the spell book, and Exothanthus like, don't you dare touch that! And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm... Wait a second, who are you, what are you doing here? Kind of thing. So he reacted badly to the spell book, but for the most part, he was kind of friendly and welcoming. And then they managed to distract him and get hold of the spell book. And my wizard PC realises that all the spells in the spell book are all the spells Faran knows. And this freaks Faran out again, because... Why has he got all the same spells as a lich? It just doesn't make any sense. They explore most of the Amber Temple and Faran is like, right, okay, we don't need to explore it all. I've got a good grip of things now. We've cleared out most of the danger. I will come back here with some guards and make sure that nobody can get in. And they also saw the library as well, which piqued his interest. And he was like, right, I'm going to get a few things, get a few people to guard this place. Uh, in addition to the fact that I want to just be, you know, make sure that bad people don't come in here like and you know go to town with all the amber vestiges he also wants to protect it and make sure that things you know so we can properly learn about all the things that are here as a thank you for escorting him he agreed to take out babala saga with them so unfortunately i didn't get the pleasure of running babala saga as a dm would normally run it in curse of strad which is i had everything prepared and after doing Argon Vostholt, we were going to do Berez, and that's around the time my players, my two players, said they were moving to Canada. And luckily, all that prep didn't go to waste because they still went to Berez. But they ended up fighting Babala Saga in the Ravenloft crypts. It's a long story I won't get into here. But essentially, he also escorted them to Castle Ravenloft, where he's like, oh, this castle looks really gaudy and rubbish. And, uh, you know, because Azalina actually hates uh, Strahd and vice versa. Uh, after. Defeating Babla Saga, reviving Casimir's sister Petrina, 
or resurrecting Casimir's sister Petrina. As they go to leave, they get to the junction. I think it's the one where you can go towards Valaki, towards the village of Barovia, or towards Castle Ravenloft. It's a black carriage junction, I think it is. And some guy is just walking down the street and he's singing a song. And Fran says, excuse me, I recognise that song. Where is he from? He goes, oh, it's an old folk song from Darkon. And now Fran's like, ugh, Darkon, I hate Darkon. And this random person walking down the street says, oh, actually, maybe you can help me. I'm looking for someone called Fran Zarhonen. And Fran's like, well, that's me. What do you need? And I had this person go, Darkless Rex sends his regards. And there ends up being this Deathlock mastermind, who I had a few minions, I can't remember what minions he had, tries to kill Ferran. But in the, in the sort of chaos of the situation, more assassins arrive. It's sort of like, what was that old movie? Was it called Smoking Aces? Yeah, there's an old movie called Smoking Aces where all these bunch of assassins try and arrive and kill this one target. I was kind of going for a Smoking Aces thing. So this Deathlock mastermind is trying to take out Ferran. At the same time, a bunch of shadow guests arrive. And then a Banderhob as well. And I played the Deathlock Mastermind as very Azalin-esque, where he's a bit sort of sarcastic and cracking jokes. If, if for those of you who've listened to the audiobook of Eistrad, The War Against Azalin, I don't know, I think there might be another version, but the version I'm familiar with is the one that's currently in an order book, which is narrated by Paul Bamer. And let me try and do my Azalin voice. I think he talks a bit like this and a bit like, ah. Oh, uh, some shadow guests have arrived. Who now we've got a party, and who who invited the Banderhob? Why is there a Banderhob here? That kind of thing. And my players, it was quite funny because they were saying they were, they were actually quite sad killing this Deathlock mastermind because they found him really funny. And this for me was I was secretly like yes because I was thinking oh um, I played him as very Aslin like, and I think oh later on when they have to they meet Aslin, uh, they're gonna see this character who's very much like that. And the Deathlock Mastermind's last words to Ferran when he was defeated were, my patron is going to destroy you. And it's hinted that the patron is Darkless Rex, but the patron was actually Azalin. So that was a, that gave him a few things to think about. So there's this lich called Darkless Rex in Darkon who wants Ferran dead for reasons. Yeah, at that point, Ferran leaves them and says, well, I'll just disguise, he's got disguise self, he's got invisibility, he's more than capable of looking after himself. Uh, he is going to uh, go back to Madame Eva and maybe just do some further exploring of the Domains of Dread while they figure out what's going on. And he wonders if the players, when they got the Louvre's Taraka of Souls, they had the second Taraka reading where they were pointed to magic items and an ally to, to scatter about all the Domains of Dread similar to the one in Curse of Strahd, where they're scattered throughout Barovia, but just on a bigger scale. He said, oh, you guys do that, and maybe the answer will become clear later. And that's the only time they've really seen Fran so far, but they're gonna see him two more times. So what I have upcoming is my players have heard about Haslan. So at the moment, I should say, we've done a bunch of domains of Dread, and they are currently, as I recall, this it just recently arrived in the domain of Forlorn, and they want to do Haslan as well, just because they've heard about Haslik and they've heard about the domain, and they're curious about it. And when they get to the domain, there's going to be this fight with a bunch of different mages who all work for Haslick. They're all like sort of apprentices and bodyguards and things like that. The wizard PC in my group has a staff of the magi, extremely powerful staff. And so Haslick will discover this and he'll want the PCs dead so he can take all their magic items. One of them will be hooded in a cloak. And this group of mages will be like be that classic thing in like TV shows and movies or so, where they're sort of like gang of unruly people are like, well, 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 look who we have here. Uh, the wizard and the paladin and the rogue and a bunch of your friends. Wow, you're not welcome here and we've come to take your stuff. Hey, Zal, they'll say to the hooded figure, you're the newest arrival. You've got a deadly spell, haven't you? You can kill somebody in just like a few words. Why don't you give it a go? And the hooded figure will approach. He'll lower his hood. At that point, my players will recognize it's Faran. And Faran will say, yeah, I'll give a demonstration. And he will cast Power Word Kill on the person who said, hey, cast Power Word Kill on one of those people. And he'll be like, ah, oh, yeah, see you. And just collapse and die. And then Faran will turn to the players and say, I'm swapping sides. Can I be on your side now? And to help you defeat these guys. And then there'll be all, all like chaos where I think there'll be like millions of castings of Counterspell, I'm sure. And he will explain after that battle that he heard that Haslick was someone who can't learn new spells like him. And he wanted to meet him, he wanted to compare notes. But when he got there, he realized that approaching him and just saying all this stuff is probably a bad idea. So he kind of went undercover as a mage who wanted to become one of Haslick's apprentices 
or servants or what have you. And that's why he was with those guys. But then he so they soon realized that Hazlux closed the borders because he doesn't want this guy with the this player with the man, staff of the Magi to leave. And so they've got to defeat Hazlux if they want any chance of escaping Hazlan. And then after that, he's going to say, right, I think we've got everything we need ready for, you know, the next steps. Come see me and Madame Eva in Barovia when you're ready. I'm kind of treat. I did say to my players, I know this isn't good for D&D, but I did say to my players, we'll treat it as kind of like RPG logic, uh, like video game RPG logic, where you can do all side quest stuff uh, and the, the final boss is waiting. But I did say, when you go back to Sir Poon Encampment in Barovia to see Madame Eva and Ferran, we're going to consider that the end game. It's that kind of bit in the video games where it says, are you sure you want to continue? You won't be able to save past this point or go back past this point. And he will basically say, come see us when you're ready. And then we'll have the end game. Fran will explain that the domain of Darkon is collapsing in on itself. The Shroud, I believe it's called. Yes, the Shroud is essentially the mists is kind of cannibalizing itself, or Darkon is cannibalizing itself. And he thinks this is tied to the prophecy, that the player's got these magic items and this fated ally for a reason, and that their enemy, the person they need to fight and defeat to save Darkon and the domains of Dread as a whole, and potentially the multiverse, is the Lich Darkless Rex. They will go to Darkon and they will confront him at Neverchar Springs. And instead of a Lich, they discover that he's actually just a Necrocore, which is a lot weaker. And I want it to be a, a quite an epic battle. Where, and I, I'm gonna, but the encounter before they find Darkless is going to be... Oh gosh, what's her name? I can't find her full name, but her name for short is Ebb. And she is a, a, a shadow dragon, a black shadow dragon who's a servant, law servant to Azalin, who will have allied with Darkless because Azalin is missing. And during that battle, she will say halfway through before she retreats, if she gets the chance to retreat, I'm not risking my life for an imposter ruler, uh, which will be Darkless. And this will make the players and Franco imposter ruler. What's going on there? And then when they go to the fight Darkless Rex, he'll be a Necrocore. He'll have some very powerful allies. There'll be an Abjura wizard, loads of undead. I think from the... Old law, there's a, a night tag who is someone who works for Azalin. So it'll be all these people, but Darkless will be one of the weakest. And as soon as they defeat Darkless, who will be quite aggressive, even though Sabjura Wizards are a bit like, no, please, you should be careful. I'm trying to protect you. Don't be attacking them and stuff. And when Darkless is destroyed, all the others will retreat. Ah, an important detail I forgot as well. Faran will explain that he's got a device or some sort of artifact that can help him find and locate a phylactery. So once they defeat Darkless, this supposed lich or fake lich, they will then be able to find out where his phylactery is. It'll be somewhere in Darkon and they've got up to 10 days to try and find it, destroy it before he's revived. As soon as they defeat Darkless, he uses it and it hones in on him. And he'll be like, oh, maybe this is Nexus somewhere. And he'll throw it to the ground and it's still focused on him, on Foran. I say, maybe it's this coat and this staff and he'll throw them away and it'll keep focusing on him. And that's when he will realize the horrifying truth. He'll say to himself, am I the phylactery? Am I Darkless's phylactery? And he'll say, no, 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 phylactery is always a container. But I suppose a person could be a container. He'll turn to the PCs and say, I know what needs to be done. If a phylactery is not destroyed, Darkless could come back and we don't know if he'll come back stronger and deadlier. This isn't the way I hope to go out, but please, I know what needs to be done. And he will lower his head and he will look to the paladin who has a vorpal sword to do the honours. And if my players refuse to do it, he'll argue with them and say, listen, we haven't got time to waste. I need to, unfortunately, sacrifice myself in order to make sure that Darkless is destroyed. Oh, and another heartwarming, uh, heart-wrenching moment is I meant to mention as well is that he'll say at one point, maybe on the way to Darkon, that he has plans to open a school and maybe he wants the wizard PC to be the head teacher and the paladin PC will be, you know, its main bodyguard and there's a rogue PC as well will have some sort of role and basically be like, I'm going to start this essentially Ravenloft Strixhaven and I want you guys involved and then he's now saying, you guys have to kill me in order to save Darkon and the Domains of Dread and the multiverse. Otherwise there's a risk that the Shroud effect will spread and destroy everything. And if they refuse to kill him, he is basically just going to probably use power word kill on himself. Assuming that's something that can be done. Hopefully that's not kind of spell. And hopefully my players won't be like, they won't fight it too much. I'll, I'll have to think of some contingencies just in case they do stop him. Maybe just 
the dark powers get involved and something happens. A bit like the whole thing with Irene, or just a lightning bolt will just be... There we go. <laughs> I'll, I'll think of some sort of deus ex machina to make it happen. And when Foran and Darkless are both deceased and in close proximity, the uh, the others, the survivors also find themselves covered and surrounded in mist. And when that mist clears, Darkless and Foran, their remains are gone. And in their heads, they hear this evil cackling laughter. And in their minds, they see this figure of this man in wizard robes but looks more like a zombie or a skeleton than a person and it will be Aslan Rex and I haven't written this all yet but I've got this sort of mini sort of two minute monologue where he'll explain that the reason that he's back is because Faran and Arclis were killed close to each other in Darkon. He has returned similar to how it is in King of the Dead the novel I mentioned earlier He'll explain that he tried to use the apparatus, which I think I'll confuse with the rift spinner, so I kind of merged the two and said the apparatus is a device that can manipulate the mists. He got the apparatus from Mordant, he got Lubus Torok of Souls from a very powerful Vistana seer. Vistani, of course, are people who can navigate, leave the mists fairly easily, and access other worlds outside of the Mains of Dread, because he was bored of Darkon, he wanted to escape the mists, he wanted to escape Darkon. He used these two devices together. But the effect was catastrophic. Castle Avernus was partially destroyed and Aslan disappeared. Some people wondered maybe he was destroyed in the process. Some people wondered if maybe he was successful and he's out there somewhere. But the truth was that he was split in two in his pure evil lich form, Darkless Rex, and in his human form with the tiny ounce of good, if he had any good at all, went into Furan Salhonan. And that is how and why he disappeared. And Faran and Darkless existed. And now he's back. He will close the borders. He will make a sort of special misty effect that means that vampires can travel during the day, such as the case in Barovia and Curse of Strahd. And that means the Karjat, who are his vampire secret police, can now walk around pretty freely. And because it's become pretty apparent to Azalin that he can't leave the domains of dread at all, he will just destroy other domains of dread for fun. He will send out armies of zombies. He's got thousands, if not tens of thousands, of zombies and other undead minions. He's going to send them out to Barovia, to Mordent, to Volkovnia, and all these other places that my players have liberated, and he will destroy them all one by one. And that will be the moment when... And, and oh, and also, because they took him to Fittitov Manor, and one of my players in his backstory has an adopted daughter, he will say, oh, why don't I send a bunch of zombies to your base because he will have the memories of both Darkless and Faran from the time that he was those two people so he knows about traveling to the Amber Temple with these guys he knows how they fight as well which will be handy in the final battle I can kind of metagame a bit and be like he knows what kinds of spells that they will cast or what abilities they can use yes he will send a bunch of zombies and other things to Barovia to take over Barovia to destroy Fittitov of Manor to go after all their friends who are living in Fittitov of Manor which is this player's adopted daughter plus a bunch of other NPC friends they've got, Esmeralda's there, Vion Horseman from Forkovnia moved there, and a bunch of others. And then they've got to try and get to the King's Tear, which is essentially the big sort of star floating above Darkon, which I think appears, if I remember the lore, appears after the whole incident with Fran trying to, uh, not Fran, sorry, Aslan trying to escape and becoming Fran and Barclas. Uh, I'm going to have it that it's essentially a floating amber dungeon because of the whole Amber Vestige thing and every, everything ties to Amber, or at least it is in my game. And the only way to get there is through Castle Avernus as well. So they got to go to the remains of Castle Avernus and try and find maybe this teleportation circle or something like that, or whatever other means to get to the King's Tier in order to take down Aslan in for good. And Aslan will wait from there and you'll have a ton of minions. And as they go through the King's Tier, they'll see reflections They'll almost like be shown instances of Faran's and Aslan's past from when Faran was a boy and he lost his brother Eric, from becoming a lich, from killing his teenage son, which is the whole thing about, oh, a lich killed his teenage son. He was the lich that killed his teenage son because in, the, in King of the Dead in the novel and in the backstory it explains that Eric tried to rebel against Aslan. I think he might still be in Faran at that point, actually. And Faran slash Aslan had no choice but to kill Eric execute him himself 
And then I'll even include a bit where he meets Strahd and ends up in Barovia. So my players realise, oh, they met Strahd once upon a time, which is the case with Janus Sunstar as well. And yes, and that will be the whole uh, thing with Faran and Azalin and the reveal of the BBEG in my campaign. And I really hope my players haven't watched this. <laughs> this is the, uh, Usually when I make these videos, it's after. But there's been a few times now I've said, oh, I'm going to do a video about Faran. And so if I waited until after that happened, we'd be waiting months, maybe even years, because they've got Forlorn, Haslan. I think they want to do the Shadowlands. Might be a whole bunch of other places. My players are completionists. They love the idea. They, I, don't, I think they're kind of happy for this campaign to go on forever. And they'll just leave Dark on until the last possible moment and everything else has been exhausted. And I'm all for that because I'm having a whale of a time running it. And that's it. I realise there's probably a lot I might have teased with Faran. Let me go back to the earlier notes because I nearly forgot about the whole thing about killing his teenage son. Now, I think I might have covered all of it, but if I've missed an important detail or if there's anything anyone would want to clarify, please leave a comment on this video or if you see this posted on Reddit and Facebook where I tend to post, feel free to ask on there. I am conscious that sometimes I go off on tangents and sometimes I digress that I might have mentioned something and then it's actually been something important that I've missed. So apologies if that's the case. Future videos. So for my Ravenloft videos, I want to do a video on Markovia the island where the Dark Lord is Dr. Frantisek Markov, or Dr. Fran for short. I did the 5e 5th edition version where instead of um, beast folk, similar to mongrel folk in Curse of Strahd, which is how it was in the original lore, because I think Curse of Strahd came out before Van Richten's Guide, and they probably at that point didn't realise they were going to introduce Markovia at all. So the Abbey of St. Markovia was a nod to the old lore, and the abbot was essentially the Curse of Strahd equivalent of Dr. Fran. And then they did Van Richten's Guide and they talked about it, but they changed it to be sapient animals. So they visited there three separate occasions, and it was one of those inter interesting scenarios where they didn't... They did fight the Dark Lord once, but they didn't kill him, and it's not one of those where they had to defeat the Dark Lord to leave. So I'm kind of... I know it's kind of the Ravenloft way that you go to a domain, you can't leave the domain, you have to defeat the Dark Lord. You defeat the Dark Lord, you can leave. Hooray. I like that for the most part for things like... Barovia, I did that with Naranjan, currently doing that with Forlorn. But I like the idea that some of the domains don't have that and you can come and go fairly easily, like in Mordant and the Carnival and Markovia. So Markovia they visited on three separate occasions and I'll just kind of talk about what lore I used for that and how I kind of run it, just in case it's useful for other people who want to run Markovia in the 5th edition way. And what else do I want to do? I want to do a recurring villains video. So this has just all been about Foran. But I want to do one where you have, again, similar, rather than having like villains tied to a domain, you defeat him and that's it. I like the idea of some villains dropping in and dropping out. People like Natalia, the werewolf who has it in for Van Richten and the Weathermay Foxgrove twins. And some from Curse of Strahd, like Escher, if he survives, that's one of Strahd's consorts. If he survives, the epilogue says he wants to be a vampire lord in his own right and i introduced him in the sea of sorrows later on stuff like that where you have villains who can drop in drop out or you can reuse them repurpose them just to make the game feel a bit more alive a bit more dynamic and you can have these faces appear disappear reappear and so on i think we'll leave it there for this one thank you mr wanderers